Bumblets are the smallest of the vivas, ovo vivavian art geese. Most species weighing only a few ounces, and since their appearance over 100 million years ago, they have become some of the most specialized of all birds. They are now highly adapted to burrowing underground. Though their common ancestor was only a part-time burrower and fed predominantly above ground, the single surviving family of the late Thermocene is completely subterranean. Unlike the beak-driven molebirds, they dig their tunnels with paddle-like wings, the underlying skeletal structure of which are almost totally vestigial except for the very large wrists, which attach almost directly to the shoulder girdle. The upper and lower arm bones are extremely reduced in size and almost immobile. The wrist, however, has a wide range of circular movement and functions as a shovel. A large claw on the thumb loosens soil while the rest of the hand pushes backwards and to the sides. The short tail of the bumblet's ancestors has been totally lost again, and to make up for the space needed in its abdomen to carry its eggs, the body of the bumblet has elongated. The feet are very small and are now positioned at the extreme end of the body, able to help push it along in its burrows, but not to walk or really to stand at all. The larger wings now do most of the work in locomotion, and are used by the bumblet to crawl through its burrows. Projected outwards to its sides, the bumblet is capable of walking quadrupedally by putting weight on its interior side of its wrists, which then move alternately forward and back, with the approximate gait, speed, and grace, or lack thereof, of a baby sea turtle as it dashes out to sea. Unlike mole birds, bumblets are carnivorous, and despite their cute and pudgy appearance, are fierce predators for their size. Though a bumblet's beak is small and usually thin, it is armed with tiny keratin teeth on both jaws, which help to secure a grip on prey, usually insects and earthworms but occasionally other vertebrates and even other birds. Once food has been captured, it is cut apart by slicing motions of the tongue, which is also lined with teeth, as in other vivas. The food is swallowed in large chunks and then further broken down in the stomach. Bumblet metabolisms are fast and they must spend most of the day feeding, even in winter, for they cannot hibernate. Bumblets have independently evolved true viviparity from the serolopes through different means. Whereas the highly muscular oviduct of serolopes toughened so that the hard eggshell fragments from hatched eggs could simply be voided without causing injury after the chick was born, like afterbirth. The bumblets are the first birds to evolve away from hard-shelled eggs entirely. The calcium content in their eggshells are low, an adaptation that leaves their eggs soft and pliable. This allows these smallest of vivas to carry multiple eggs at a time without the risk of them bumping together and breaking in the mother's body. This increases the female's potential fertility, allowing her to raise broods of as many as five chicks at a time compared to the single offspring of almost every other viva, which can be very beneficial, for compared to larger animals, her average lifespan as a small prey animal is often much shorter. It comes with considerable costs, however, to still fit in her body cavity, made even smaller by her lack of a tail. Her eggs are proportionally much smaller than those of other vivas, relative to her body weight, and her chicks hatch out in a much more dependent and vulnerable state. Indeed, they are not only blind, featherless, and completely dependent on her for food and warmth for the first few weeks of their lives, but they hatch out even with underdeveloped skeletons 
composed almost totally of cartilage. Without calcium in the eggshell, bone development is delayed until after hatching, when the mother begins to feed her chicks a rich secretion of crop milk high in minerals necessary for their growth. Shortly before giving birth, a mother bumblet must thus create a suitably safe and secure nest underground where her young will spend the first few weeks of their lives. Another issue with life underground is a lack of oxygen. The adult bumblet itself manages to get by with proportionally large lungs and a highly efficient system of air sacs. The developing eggs in its oviduct, however, are at a high risk of suffocation in this stagnant environment. Most vivas living above ground rely on rhythmic pumping of their abdominal walls in order to produce negative pressure, sucking air into the cloaca and oxygenating the oviduct similarly to a lung. But oxygen concentrations in the burrows inhabited by the bumblet are often extremely low. To keep its eggs oxygenated, bumblets have had to adopt a new strategy which would not work for larger animals. Their oviducts have completely closed off to the cloaca by a valve, and instead, the tissue of the oviduct itself is extremely oxygenated. Gases absorbed through the mother's respiratory system are diffused directly from her blood into the chamber where her eggs are incubated, and waste gases, mainly carbon dioxide, are expelled occasionally as a puff of flatulence from her backside. For most of the year, bumblets don't normally come to the surface unless their tunnels are flooded, in which case they may be seen scurrying for higher ground in large numbers. They must do so in order to find a mate, however, and these few nights a year are likely the only reason that the bumblet retains an acceptable sense of vision for it certainly doesn't have much function underground. Females sit at the openings to their tunnels while males leave theirs to find them. Both sexes emit ultrasonic chirps, forming a duet which becomes faster as the partners come closer until the calls join them in a single hum. There is no courtship, and it seems females are not very particular usually accepting any male that comes to their doorstep, allowing the gauntlet of predators that capitalize on the emergence of the males from their tunnels to do all the thinning necessary of the weakest genes in the pool. After mating, the female returns underground and the male continues on his trek to find another partner. In most bumblets, he'll try his luck until sunup and then return to the burrow to feed and restore his energy preserves. For the male of the sacrificial bumblet, however, this is not enough. Even if he mates several females, he is instinctively driven to continue, putting himself at risk more and more the longer he stays above ground. The harsh reality is, however, that no matter what he does once he leaves the burrow, his fate is sealed. Even the fastest and slyest males, which manage to avoid predators, will not return home. Spending as long as three days on a sexual binge and forgoing all feeding, even the most fortunate will eventually die of exhaustion. Only the female sacrificial bumblet ever makes it to her second year of life. Males almost invariably die after mating, either from predators or starvation. By providing the ultimate sacrifice, which provides their common name, by removing themselves from their burrows and territory, their mates and developing offspring will have more resources for themselves. The Sacrificial Bumblet this species is typical in size and form for most of its family. It grows to about 7 inches in length and weighs about 4 ounces. 
females are marginally larger than males. ...have continued to thrive in the tropical climate Serena has offered them since the start of the Thermocene, building upon their adaptations and becoming increasingly at home on the land. They have made themselves at home across the globe, broadly filling niches which on Earth would be taken by reptiles and amphibians. They are predominantly cold-blooded creatures dependent on the environment to keep themselves either warm or cool. They scurry along forest floors, pulling themselves along with long claws derived from their fin rays or bounding inchworm style through the trees, supported by a long, prehensile tail. One group of tribit in particular, however, is worth mentioning on our latest stop to the late Thermocene era, the Hoppers. Already fully terrestrial 50 million years ago, another 50 million years of highly favorable warm and wet conditions has seen in this particularly successful lineage the appearance of many new adaptations and specializations which are not found in the rest of its kin. Among these have been the development of a proper forearm, not simply a mobile lobe with claws, but complete with a bony skeletal support and shoulder, elbow, and wrist joints, together allowing greatly increased mobility. The tail in this group has developed joints as well, coming to resemble an additional leg more than a prehensile tail. The two forelimbs are semi-sprawling, projecting slightly outwards, but the tail, twisted 90 degrees directly underneath the body so that it flexes back and forth relative to the spine, now functions as an erect limb. It is tipped in three to four grasping digits, also edged in keratinized claws and capable of grasping in some species providing not only a leg, but a hand. Some hoppers thus become climbers. The beginning of a neck apparent in their ancestors has become longer and can now rotate as far as 90 degrees to either side, allowing the animals to look around for food or danger without having to totally rotate their bodies. Two species of hopper from the late Thermocene, a semi-orboreal omnivore on the top and a terrestrial carnivore below, shown both at rest and with jaw extended in pursuit of prey. Hoppers are small animals, rarely much larger than a rat, but they are still able to compete successfully with many of their kin, sometimes even more so. This is because hopper metabolism is particularly advanced compared to that of other species, and indeed, they are especially active among their kin, an attribute that has likely evolved simultaneously along with their adaptations to move more rapidly and efficiently over land. This is because they have become capable of maintaining their body temperature to a few degrees above that of ambient conditions, and thus no longer as dependent on the sun to warm themselves at the start of the day. Because of this, hoppers can also continue to be active and feed even when on fairly cool or cloudy days, when other tribits will be forced to retire to the safety of a den or burrow and lie inactive until conditions improve. No longer needing their dorsal fins for thermoregulation, they've lost these structures entirely. Hoppers are the first tribit to develop a solid palate in their upper jaw, which effectively separates the mouth from the nasal chambers, allowing them to breathe through their nostrils while feeding. The respiration of hoppers is more efficient than that of their ancestors 
and they are capable of breathing in and out simultaneously, increasing the amount of oxygen they can get out of every breath. This puts the hopper on par with birds so far as respiratory efficiency and past mammals, such as ourselves, which must exhale before taking in a new breath, wasting a considerable percentage of the oxygen in the process. Even the lungs of hoppers have been improved from their ancestors, becoming chambered. The increase of space for gas exchange further improves the amount of oxygen they can get from each breath. And the more oxygen they can dissolve from their tissues, the more active they can be without tiring. In warm conditions, hoppers may be as active as fully warm-blooded birds, only slowing down and retiring to a sheltered place to wait out the cold if temperatures fall behind approximately 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. More oxygen also allows for the evolution of larger brains and social behaviors. Some hoppers develop parental care and watch over the offspring, carrying them or leading them to food and away from predators, rather than simply abandoning them to their fate after birth. Though some tribits share some convergent traits to tetrapods, particularly in the design of the hopper forearm, the tribit jaw is considerably distinct from the tetrapod jaw and retains many features from their teleost fish ancestors. In particular, the jaws of many including the hoppers themselves, are still extensible, elongating when the animal opens its gape and retracting when the mouth is closed as a result of a mobile maxilla attached via a mobile joint to the front and side of the skull. Attached on the lower end to the upper, the premaxilla, and the lower jaw formed in the tribits by a fusion of the mandible to the operculum, the jaw is thus opened by sliding the maxilla from a nearly horizontal position to a nearly vertical one, projecting both jaws forward in the process. By elongating their jaws in this fashion, predatory hoppers can improve their chances of grabbing small, fleeing prey items before they have the chance to escape, and herbivores can improve their reach to get the higher leaves or branches, if only by a little bit. There is one way in which hoppers haven't yet been able to improve upon the ancestral tribit body plan, however. They, like all tribits, can still only very crudely chew their food by gnashing their jaws together, relying on their stomachs to do most of the work. The ears of all tribits are bone-supported structures attached to the operculum. A remnant of fleshy gill covers, the ear of many tribits continues to become a more effective sound-amplifying device, which in the hoppers can now be rotated to exactly pinpoint the noises of predators or prey. Transferring sound down into ossified gill arches hidden under the brain case, which now function as the tribit's ear canals, transferring sound to the brain. As it originates from the operculum bone, a hopper's ears move forward when it opens its jaws, coming to rest directly behind the eye when the jaw is opened to its full extent, and sliding towards the back of the brain case when the jaw is closed. A diagram showing the major bones involved in opening and closing a tribit's jaw and how they move in relation to each other.